Joe Baez is a second year PhD student in American Studies at the George Washington University. In 2018, he received his BA in Women's and Gender Studies and Political Science from CUNY City University of New York, Brooklyn College. He is a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow, a former City University of New York Pipeline Fellow, and an alumnus of the Institution for the Recruitment of Teachers Summer Internship Program. His research is centered around queer and trans of color, fat aesthetics as they pertain to questions of online discrimination, most notably the no fats, no femmes culture. As a scholar, Joe dreams of radically transforming the ways we love ourselves, our bodies, and each other. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Joe Bias, our guest lecturer on Bless Are the Hot Fat Girls, an introduction to queer and trans of color fat aesthetics. So 20 times I was told my body was not good enough. One, my mom wanted to take photos of me dressed in professional attire for my first academic conference. While she loved the clothes I wore, she asked me not to turn to the side because she did not want to take a photo of my belly protruding. Two, I was photographed six times last summer um, for wearing short shorts. <clears throat> Three, every time I saw my father in the last two years, he would ask me if I considered going on a diet. Four, on my best friend's birthday last summer, I wore an unbuttoned dress shirt, and as I passed by a Dominican man, he said, Diantre, tell him something. Five, I was a part of a theater company my freshman year of college. I was always cast as a straight masculine misogynist despite my desires to play feminine characters. Six, a tall white man came up to me at a gay bar, slid one finger down my cheek and said, you are so, so beautiful, but if only you would lose some weight. And then he suggested a surgery that quote, worked for him. Seven, my English teacher from high school, who also had a lap band surgery, messaged me on Facebook telling me that although my body positivity is great, I should still try to lose some weight because being fat was not safe. Eight, when I came home last Thanksgiving, my father struggled to make eye contact with me because he could not stop staring at my stomach. Nine, I spent $400 I did not have for a dress suit jacket that would have cost a smaller person less than one-fourth of the amount. 10. On the metro in Washington, D.C., a man scribbled into a crumbled piece of paper and dropped it on the seat next to me as he exited the metro. 11. On the metro in Washington, D.C., a group of teenagers pointed at me laughing and mockingly pinned me as one of the youngster's future husbands. 12. On a dating app called Growler, a man begged to have sex with me, but he insisted he rubbed my belly the entire time. 13. On Growler, I was told that this man's dream threesome is to be sandwiched between two really fat men. 14. On another app, Grinder, I was messaged repeatedly by a fitness instructor who said, you're, you're cute, but that's not healthy. You're putting your life at risk. 15. On Grinder, after messaging a man I was attracted to, he replied, no, just no. 16. On Grinder, I received a message of six vomiting emojis and the words, you're disgusting. 17. On Grinder, I received a message of 13 pig emojis and the words, ugly, fat, pig. 18. When I am messaged positively online, men always begin our exchange by telling me how much they love bigger guys. 19. This quarantine, a man followed me in a white van honking at me until I reached the grocery store. 20. I have, always, I have been sexually absent for nearly two years because being sexually inactive feels safer than actively seeking it out. I begin with this poem as I always do when I give a talk because my lived experiences as a queer, fat, femme, Afro-Latinx person living in this body are at the heart of my intellectual and my intellectual inquiry and my career aspirations. Doing research on queer, fat people of color like myself for almost six years now has let me make sense of my experiences 
but more importantly, it has allowed me to heal from them. While these experiences may never end, they continuously reify my decision to become an educator who fights against these experiences. From this autobiographical starting point, we are about to pivot and explore visual culture that exists within this social political context. A lecture I have titled, Blessed are the Hot Fat Girls, an Introduction to Queer and Trans of Color Fat Aesthetics. And as instructor Dazzle mentioned, my name is Joe Baez. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of American Studies at George Washington University. So my learning objectives for us all today are first to define and understand theories about identity and the body that are necessary for reading aesthetics. Following that, I will be defining aesthetics um, and demonstrate one approach to conducting an aesthetic analysis. And then finally, I'm going to foreground the political potential of aesthetic strategies. So first, to start off with the term queer, queerness for our purposes today will be defined as an umbrella term that is synonymous for LGBTQ identity. Other definitions within scholarship include queerness representing people who do not have normative sexual and romantic desires, and in a broader, more abstract sense, people who might not fit in a society for questions besides sex and love. And so two examples that I've considered for this definition are people who might not be considerably out within um, a non-heterosexual sense or people who just do not want to identify at all. Following this, I define the term transgender as an umbrella term for identities that are not cisgender. And to just unpack this definition more, cisgender refers to a person whose gender identity corresponds with the sex the person had or was identified as having at birth. Then a gender identity is a person a person's internal sense of being a man, a woman, both, or neither. So this diagram here is of the genderbred person. I found it in my intro to women's studies class back in undergrad. And here, it does a great job at representing how these kinds of categories and vocabulary around gender, sex, and sexuality are represented, are represented in our bodies and in our minds, and also shows that these things are on a spectrum, but also leaves room for the opportunity and for the reality that these also could just not be on the spectrum at all. Next, I want to get into a vocabulary about racism. Um, and first and foremost, I want to to define the term white supremacy. Um, quite literally, the term means and refers to the idea or ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. And when we think of white supremacy, for the most part, we think about the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis and very extreme um, vocal expressions of this. But for our purposes, I want us to think about white supremacy in a more encapsulating way with this following definition instead. White supremacy here is defined as being present in institutional and cultural assumptions that assign value, morality, goodness, and humanity to the white group while casting people and communities of color as worth less, immoral, bad, and inhuman, and undeserving. To further add on to this, another the definition continues that saying that white supremacy is a referring to a political and socioeconomic system where white people enjoy structural advantage and rights that other groups do not have, both at a collective and an individual level. And so I think expanding the definition of white supremacy beyond extreme examples is incredibly important um, because while the word racist serves effectively at calling out oppression based on categories of race and ethnicity, white supremacy encapsulates all different kinds of actions. And a lot of us might be dissociating from white supremacy um, 
based on whatever reasons, but white supremacy can encapsulate the most minuscule kinds of actions and the most extreme examples that we've seen in the United States history with the Ku Klux Klan and with neo-Nazis. Next is a more specific term for racism known as anti-blackness. So the movement for black lives defines anti-blackness as a two-part formation that both voids blackness of value while systematically marginalizing black people and their issues. One part of this is overt racism, thinking of the outward vocal expressions that we see a lot of extremists commit. And then second, thinking about, again, the structural, the systemic, and the covert things that we might not be necessarily visibly confronted with in our day-to-day lives as we would see people being more overt. So anti-blackness here serves a lot of important function, functions that white supremacy does not. Anti-blackness first can expand to think about racism on a global scale and also gives a vocabulary that holds people of color accountable to being racist towards black people. Um, an example of this would be thinking about my ethnicity. So my parents were born in the Dominican Republic. And if you know or not, the Dominican Republic has a long, long history with anti-blackness. Two examples would be the act of skin bleaching, where Dominicans would bleach their skin to appear lighter and white passing um, under the belief that having phenotypically black features and darker skin and kinky hair are undesirable. And then there's also a lot of the violence that they have committed to Haitians um, on the notion of being anti-black. So this term is very helpful for us thinking about power and racism um, in a more nuanced way and holding people of color accountable in this definition. As we think about blackness as a concept and as a reality, I want to break it off into two kinds of definitions. So a lot of scholarship in the academy thinks about blackness through abjection. Abjection here, simply defined, is the state of being cast off, othered, marginalized, etc. And a quote that I think really gets at abjection is here presented by Malcolm X. So Malcolm X in a speech said, The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And so here, abjection and think about blackness through the lens of abjection is hyper aware of the ways in which violence and oppression operates, um, whether it be through legislation, through physical violence, through taking life, um, or through disenfranchisement, through gentrification, appropriation, and other concepts, and things about blackness through the sense of the harms that are constantly committed to people because they are black. On the other side of this, we have thinking about blackness through an absence of abjection. An example that I wanted to bring up is thinking about Black Girl Magic as a hashtag, um, whose agenda is to celebrate the beauty, power, and resilience of Black women. And so thinking about Black Girl Magic as a hashtag thinks about Blackness and Black identity and reality in a sense that violence is a part of it, oppression is a part of it, marginalization is a part of it. But instead of centering that as a part of the analysis it is intended to be a positive uplifting kind of movement that prioritizes black life black joy and black pleasure over the kinds of harms and atrocities that happen daily and so i think these two examples both should be held together at the same time when looking at blackness and black people's realities in america and in the world But to kind of compartmentalize the definitions, we have one that focuses more exclusively on the harms committed and one that prioritizes thinking about life within and adjacent to violence and oppression. So let's talk about fatness. So for our purposes here, I've presented three kinds of definitions for fatness and connotations. So there's fatness as a negative connotation 
And these kinds of thoughts of fatness include the ideas that fat people and fatness is unhealthy, deadly, unkept, um, and that fat people demonstrate a lack of self-control. Next is just a neutral descriptor that refers to someone's body size without enforcing a value judgment. And then finally, we have a fat positive connotation that eliminates shame, stigma, and decrees that, that fatness is beautiful, worthy, and deserving. And in this connotation, fatness and being fat is encouraged. For our purposes, I want to keep our definition within a fat neutral context, but my political ideologies around fatness are within a fat positive realm. That in turn leads us to fat phobia, which is the fear and or dislike of fat people very simply. But to kind of nuance your definition and thinking about fat phobia, I want to just posit these words here, stigma, a mark of shame or discredit, think back to the negative connotations, pathology, which is the study of disease and problems. So thinking about the the extensive amounts of health research done about obesity, and finally implicit bias, which is which are the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. And here I want to focus on this because I think a lot of fat phobia is rooted in implicit bias. A lot of system oppressions are, but fat phobia ex ex specifically. And so what implicit bias looks like for fat people can be so many different things, including studies that show that fat people are discriminated against when applying for jobs um, and more fatal consequences of when fat people are denied adequate health care because of their body size and because they are seen as having all these underlying health conditions. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of work is being done through people's testimonies, personal experiences, and through empirical research that fat people are not being given the adequate health care in the pandemic because fatness and having a high body mass index are labeled under the list of conditions that can lead to complications to COVID. Um, I know stories of people who are being denied health ventilators over thinner people um, as one example of this discrimination in the healthcare system. And to tie these, these theories together, we have the concept of intersectionality presented by Kimberly Crenshaw in her 1991 article, Mapping the Margins. In an interview she did recently revisiting the concept, Crenshaw defines intersectionality as a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It is not simply that there's a race problem here, a gender problem here, and a class or LGBTQ problem there. Many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. And to reiterate, intersectionality is a framework for better understanding oppression and is very necessary. Not only is it necessary to understand people's realities on more than one identity, but the fact of the matter is that systems of oppression operate together. White supremacy does not operate without capitalism, which does not operate without heterosexism, without patriarchy, without ableism, and fat phobia. And so our re intersectionality is in some ways inevitable, and Crenshaw is credited with giving us a concept and a vocabulary for speaking to such an inevitable um, way of producing knowledge. Here's a really helpful diagram that I googled called the web of oppression um, that really just maps out these kinds of things. So closer to the center of the circle are identities that are privileged um, in different societies. And then as we get outside the circle, we have identities that are not and experience oppression. And so I present all these identities to help us think through the body and how to read a body. So the relationship between how we look and who we are is incredibly complicated. I think a lot of us know that 
the ways that we dress ourselves and present ourselves are in some ways performative or fictitious. But nonetheless, identities have these physical markers that we recognize. For example, body hair is seen to be a masculine feature associated with men. Certain walking patterns are gendered. Certain speech patterns are gendered. And while these things um, are part of our physical realities, I'm here to argue today that they are socially constructed, which means that they, the body and how we operate is real, but how we make sense of it is continuously taught to us. And I present myself here as an example um, of, I guess, just like a body being read. In this photo, which is for my department photo on the website, I... You can read many different things. First, you can read my race as not being white. You can read my facial hair as reading me as masculine um, or towards manhood or as a man. Um, you can see here that my, I have a body of size, that I'm fat. Um, and some people would make judgments about my sexuality based on this. I also want to add that if we look at this bookshelf and the books behind it, they are markers of a certain class. Um, you can maybe deduce that I do something intellectual at a library or in the academy through this background, um, which makes implications about my intellect and my class level. And so once again, these things may or may not be true, but we know that when we look at these things, we can make deductions that we have learned um, through to being members of society. So moving forward into thinking about aesthetics, aesthetics um, is, a sc our sc is a school of Western philosophy that was started in the 18th century. Um, it is concerned with beauty, taste, and other kinds of value judgments. And nowadays, there are a lot of practitioners of aesthetics that are not necessarily in the realm of philosophy. And so they're engaging with art still, and they're also engaging with visual culture, which is a broad term which encompasses things like TV, music, and radio, and things like memes as well. And it's engaging these things on a sensorial body level, so it's looking less so about if these things are beautiful or not, which is what original Western philosophy did, and just looking at them for what is going on in terms of physicality and visuals but without the necessary value judgment of beautiful or ugly. So we're going to look at two um, primary sources for the rest of the talk. Um, and so the first one is by Fatima Jamal. Fatima Jamal is a black, fat, trans, femme person. She is an interdisciplinary artist, writer, public speaker, and stunning model. And on Instagram and Twitter, her handle is Fat Femme. And she is known for producing this awesome documentary that's still in production called No Fats, No Femmes. And it should be done the next year or so. So we're going to look at a video that she did a couple years back. And then we're going to talk about it. You're awesome. Fuck your chest hair. Fuck your beard. Fuck your privilege. Fuck that you aren't made to feel shame always. Fuck your thinness. Fuck your muscles. Fuck your attractive fatness. Fuck your shaming me for nothing. Fuck your accusations that I produce shame. Fuck your reading me as a character. Fuck your destruction of my personhood. Fuck your marginalization of my identity. Fuck your judging me for self-care. Fuck your ability to be assertive. Fuck your lack of socialization to be a submissive. Fuck your asking me to produce safety for you and not myself. Fuck the amount of effort I exert to get less than enough consideration. Fuck that the amount of space I take up in the world is constantly questioned. Fuck that people think I am a slut. Fuck that you can demand attention. Fuck that I am willing to give you what I can't have. Fuck that your values and your actions never match up when it comes to me. Fuck that I can't expect anything from anyone. 
fuck that the amount of work I put into the beauty of my intellect and my talent is still never enough. Amen. Blessed are the sissies. Blessed are the boy dykes. Blessed are the people of color, my beloved kith and kin. Blessed are the trans. Blessed are the high fans. Blessed are the sex workers. Blessed are the authentic. Blessed are the gender illusionists. Blessed are the non-normative. Blessed are the genderqueers. Blessed are the kinksters. Blessed are the disabled. Blessed are the hot fat girls. Blessed are the weirdo queers. Blessed is the spectrum. Blessed is consent. Blessed is respect. Blessed are the beloved I didn't describe. I couldn't describe. I will learn to describe respect, and love. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. All right, let me try to figure this out. Um, oh, wonderful. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that, that primary source has meant a lot to me over the years. Um, and my work used to be on online dating apps more exclusively but now thinking about aesthetics i'll lead us in a discussion of what we just saw aesthetically so first just to unpack what we saw i think it's important for us to maybe just work on like some bare bones descriptions of what we saw we saw a black fat person reciting some words directly into the camera we heard a heartbeat after every repetition next we heard um, a change in stanzas, and we saw the camera changing to different body parts. And then finally, we saw a group of people walking around in a circle, um, voguing and making very sharp poses. And so thinking about what these months looked like visually, on the upper left-hand corner, we have Fatima's face. Fatima's face is doing very particular things in this video. Of course, Fatima is looking straight into the camera and speaking to us. Um, and when the lines start at the beginning, they're very confrontational and addressing systems of oppression. We also have some interesting frames of Fatima serving face, which were referred to the act of posing, um, giving intense looks into the camera. And then we also have her stroking her neck and just indulging her body. In the next frame, I wanted to isolate her mouth as doing certain things. It does a tongue pop. It zoomed in on certain words. Um, and thinking about sound here as well, the heartbeat is referential. Um, but it, with the mouth tongue popping and emphasizing the words, it is also speaking to sound effects that are taking place in the video. My favorite part of the video looking at it today is the shirt that says can't afford this. I love it because it's such a very short moment and it's it doesn't give us the full-on moment. We don't get the shirt being completely put on or we don't see it resting on Fatima's body. And it leaves us to wonder and make statements about what that is. And I wanted to speak to, to that for a quick second at the end. And then finally, we have this group of people that are walking in circles, voguing um, and staring into the camera as well. Here, I read these people in some ways like a chorus echoing what Fatima is saying and staring to the camera to be a part of this very intense confrontation with the viewer. But also, I want to read these people as Fatima's allies and comrades within a queer and trans Black context. Going back to the shirt for a second, I'm really struck by the shirt today, especially thinking about the notion of being something you cannot afford. It implies that at some point Fatima was shirtless, um, and in this act of covering her body, she's also denying us that altogether. And given the words of the poem saying, fuck your whiteness, fuck your beauty, not only is she kind of damning these systems that are denying her desirability, 
but she's reclaiming that desirability and saying, fuck these systems, but you still cannot have me regardless. She's not opting in to being, a, to being desirable or assimilating into that desirability. She's saying no to all of the things. And just to pivot really quickly, if I can, hold on. Fatima is reading a poem by Mark Aguhar, which is called Litanies to My Heavenly Brown Body. It's a litanies, from what I found, is a religious text and follows like a certain format of damning a lot of things and then honoring things with the word blessed. Uh, this poem is really aggressive in a really beautiful way and just curses out a lot of these different systems that are constantly marginalizing people on sexual contexts, interpersonal contexts, etc. And then finally, when it pivots, it honors a lot of the identities that Fatima would be in allyship with, working with, and that are people who are constantly marginalized by desirability politics that the entire documentary is founded on. It's a great poem and definitely check it out. So pivoting to our second primary source, oh, sorry. That being said, we're going to just unpack what doing an aesthetic analysis would look like. And so what I attempted to model here are some of these guiding questions. When I do an aesthetic analysis, I want to ask first and foremost, what is going on? I think when I first saw this video back in undergrad, I was very overwhelmed trying to make sense of what I was seeing, and especially with these very intense heartbeat sounds. So I think the first thing you should be doing when you're ever engaging with any form of visual media that you're working with analytically or just consuming as you scroll through is to ask yourself what is going on. Another question would be, is there anything referential here? And if we had more time, I would show you what this performance of Litany's is doing referentially. There's a documentary by Marlon Riggs titled Tongues Untied, which is about the lived experiences of black gay men in America. And so it's an ode to that and also highly referential to it. And so after this, I wanna pivot to the more personal kinds of questions that kind of empower and energize an analysis. So one of those questions would be, what is striking you about this work? For me, it fluctuates. Today, I'm really focused on that shirt. There have been other times where I just cannot get over the fact that Fatima is saying, fuck all of these things. And there's something very mesmerizing about the voguing that's happening that's very nonverbal. And then finally, the most important question for me doing analysis is how does it make you feel? First and foremost, we are not objective viewers. We do not engage with things um, as just neutral bystanders. We have feelings about what we're engaging with. And when you're doing an aesthetic analysis, it's important to have those emotions front and center as much as you can because they're going to inform your analysis regardless. When I first encountered this work in undergrad, I felt really, really seen by it. I think it was a really intense moment of feeling that someone was giving a vocabulary to things that I had been feeling for a while when I was younger. And so not only does that inform my relationship to the primary source, but it also makes me read it in a very generous, empowering context. And then finally, once you've done these preliminary questions, it would be time to do some research and figure out the intention of the artist and the social political context that it's happening in. And I emphasize here the intention because while we might have our first impressions of a work, we also are going to face the intentions one way or another if we have access to them. And so it's interesting to see how something makes you feel and if that artist or that creator was meant to make you feel that way at all. And now we're going to move on to our second source, which is by Mark Aguhar. Mark Aguhar is a queer, trans femme, fat, Filipinx person. She was an activist, writer, and multimedia fine artist. And her art, like Fatima's, 
examined gender, beauty, sexuality, and race. And her Tumblr, which still operates today, is which is still available today, is is um, Call Out Queen. Uh, you can look up Call Out Queen, and there's a few different blogs. And her blog is the agenda of it is to be blogging for brown girls. And um, Mark is no longer with us. She took her life in 2012. And so this is her video. So, yeah, so I found that video in, in May as I was writing my research paper, and I'm absolutely in love with it for so many reasons, but I think my initial, like, I can't stop laughing at it whenever I see it, but the only thing I'm truly mad about as I watch it over again is, like, the fact that it's powdered donuts. I will always just be mad that it's powdered donuts because they're disgusting and they should be other ones, but nonetheless, the video is so incredible for so many things it's doing in a fat femme queer and trans um brown context so these screen caps are not accurate about the moments i wanted to capture um but there's so many things that we're going to just delve into really quickly first there's so much to say about the regular the everydayness 
of the production where Fatima's video is clearly produced, the camera angles are dynamic. This one is clearly videographed from fo like photo booth on a Mac on the floor of a studio. And Mark's presentation here is really high femme. The pink blouse, the, the pink lipstick, and the eyeshadow. And just Mark spends so many seconds and so many frames just enamored by herself in a similar way that Fatima is when she strokes her neck. The powdered donuts come into the frame and the white hand never identifies itself as a full body, which is very interesting. And one of the most interesting parts of the video is how first to first how after every eating of the donut mark has to adjust herself and then proceed to indulge in herself some more it's always like this very subtle wipe as we get in the second frame um and then secondly the gradual increase in the sexuality of this video is so interesting and it just affirms fatness and femme identity and brownness in such a way um but what i want to what i'm really fixated on as i move forward with this research and looking at this video is the music so the music really asks us so many questions about their relationship the first song is be my baby by the ronettes and the second song is why don't they love fond love which is also by the ronettes and so while mark Aguhar and her content was very tongue-in-cheek a lot of the times if we take this video in a vacuum and unpack this relationship it reads romantic but it also reads as a video about desire the song be my baby is a love song about becoming lovers and why don't they let us fall in love offers a more dismal unrequited sense of love and so reading that makes us question what is the relationship between these two people um and also given the anonymity of the hand and one thing i want to finally flag for us is the the whiteness of the hands and the masculinity that that is involved with it so while again while we should not read body hair as representative of manhood this entity does read as like a masculine dominant kind of hand as it pokes the donut in Mark's mouth in the first frame and is the one that is feeding Mark. There is a sense of power here that is being played with. Um, and so, and, and I think what I love about the, the video the most is that it sits with this power dynamic. Mark in some ways is super empowered here, controlling the rate in which she eats the donuts or when she gets fed them but nonetheless there is this sense of she is at possibly someone's feet as she's doing this and so it plays with power in some ways where where fatima is saying fuck your whiteness mark might be saying something different and indulging in whiteness and a white masculine figure here so many things to say about the video And so aesthetics, both analytically and visually, are so interesting and have so much power in them for so many reasons. On an intellectual level, they're everywhere, especially on social media. And so with some kinds of resources in academia, it might be hard to find these kinds of things, but I found these things on YouTube and I constantly scroll through my Instagram feed and see queer and trans fat people of color engaging in visual media that is meant to empower and push back against white supremacy, heterosexism, transphobia, and fatphobia. And so aesthetics are readily accessible for all of us to enjoy. And when it comes to doing aesthetics, aesthetics can be deeply and readily political. And I put here that revolt can happen at the level of the body because sometimes it does. Um, Sometimes I think it's important to understand liberation and protests as things that can happen in legislative fields on the streets, but can also be how we dress ourselves and present ourselves to the world. Further, engaging in aesthetic strategies can be a practice of self-love in this act of reclamation and fashioning our bodies in ways that pleasure us 
in particular. And further, they make statements in ways that written words do not. I can't imagine feeling the ways that I felt about both of these videos if they were just translated in written form. With Fatima's video, Mark had written these words, but Fatima's performance of them activates them and animates them in a way that poetry cannot or cannot do so so easily. And so aesthetics offers such a way to visually push back against these strategies. And when they are queer and trans of color fat aesthetics, they are pushing back on structures that deem these kinds of bodies, these people's realities as undesirable and not lovable. And so aesthetic strategies offer such interesting takes on responses to when you are told that your body is not good enough. And I leave you with these two quotes offered by this interesting article by Tasha Yingling on fat futurity. And so just the first quote reads, in the digital medium, fat identity is claimed in ways that market with a brand of permanence outlined in fat futurity so that fat is an ownership denouncing the quest for a thin body, anchoring the body beyond the pathologized limited, and signaling a future where the present realities of fat existence are humanized. The second quote from the article reads, this is not a future about losing weight to reach an ideal. This is a future where the present contours of the body are legitimized, no matter their expansion or decrease in lifetime. And so again, my work examines these kinds of aesthetics, and I'm mostly working within the digital context, both because of their accessibility, but because I think contemporary fat, con queer trans fat, of color content in 2020 is doing such amazing work of pushing back against constant stigma, but also showing people that fat is livable, fat is doable, and that fat is beautiful. And so thinking about futurity in this sense, it's important to think about aesthetics as a way of thinking about the futures as content does. I think we're living in a moment in 2020, given all the things that are going on, where we're turning to digital mediums, to social media, as ways to cope with our present and aim for the future. And I think queer and trans and fat aesthetics are doing this work of constantly orienting us to futures and poses and self-fashionings and the eatings of donuts that will keep us surviving in a way that we move past abjection and towards joy, pleasures, and the lacks of abjection. Thank you.